Hello and welcome to episode 260 of the Epic Film Challenge to 1001 Movies You Must See Before You Die from 1999, directed by Paul Thomas Anderson. It is the film that is titled Magnolia. What did you think? Haha, ha. every time you do that, it's just ha ha. We're never going to really go through it. <laughs> it cracks me up. Okay, so Magnolia, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson. I saw this. It's tradition. Uh, I saw this when I was a teenager, I think. I don't know how I sat through it for three hours, but I, that's one thing I should mention. I very sneakily did not tell Connie this was three hours long. I knew you would never sit down for a film that I'm not even going to tell you what the plot is if I told you it was three hours long. So by the end of the night, you were like, you didn't tell me it was fucking three hours long. <laughs> but I was hoping you'd get sucked into I it. I wanted and you to say five years, because that's what it felt like. I was going to say, I was going to say, you were going to say... I was hoping that you would get drawn into it and not notice that it was at least... Maybe you'd think it was a two and a half hour long movie, but... I was hoping I'd have at least one hour to myself at the end of the night before I had to go to bed. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, and that's why we started around seven or eight or whatever. Yeah, so... But no. So this is a film that, it, that follows a bunch of characters in the same town over a 24 hour period. It's, it's three plus hours and it's one of his... I'm not sure when Paul Thomas Anderson first started making films... I very much like his films, but I haven't seen enough of them. I've seen Boogie Nights. I've ever seen Mag seen Magnolia. Uh, this is my probably my second time watching it all the way through, I think. And then Phantom Thread was the most recent one I saw. So there's like a, a big gap for me. The Master, Inherent Vice, I think is his. Uh, Punch Drunk Love. There's quite a few of his I haven't got to yet. Anyway, this is a film that follows many characters in the same town, like I just said, over a 24 hour period. So we have, and I don't remember character names, even though we watched this a few days ago. We have Tom Cruise, who plays a lifestyle guru, we'll, we'll say. Oh, and we'll try not to go into too much spoilers to begin for with men. on this. For men, yes. Very specifically tailored specifically to men. Specifically for men. Uh, and there's a woman who's It would not fly now. <laughs> and, and, well, it might. And there's a woman who, as a, as a real <laughs> thing, yeah, in a movie, probably. So Tom Cruise's character, he is being interviewed by a woman about what he does and all that kind of thing. That's one part of the story. There is a cop played by John C. Riley who meets a woman who's a drug addict. And that's the second part of the story is this kind of kind cop who, uh, you know, seems to be you know trying to do well. Like at the beginning of the film, uh, he gets called to a woman's house and there's a big thing going on and he kind of discovers something big. And once he kind of goes through all the, the procedures and everything, the the other police come in and they kind of shut him out. I don't know if you remember that, where all the other police just take over and he's just like stood in the background. He gets kind of like walked over, even oh, though, I don't remember yeah, that. even though he was the one who kind of, you know, sorted this thing out or at least kind of discovered something, he very much gets pushed to the back. So he's a guy who's kind of struggling a little bit and he meets a woman who's a drug addict and she's another part of the story. Then there is a guy who runs, uh, is the host of a quiz show. And, uh, and he's kind of ill, he's dying with cancer, I think, and he's about to do his last show, hosting the quiz show. That's another part of the story. His daughter is the drug addict, and he tries to see her near the beginning of the film. <laughs> then there is a young boy who is going to be um, one of the uh, kids on the quiz show, and he's under a lot of pressure from his father and all these kinds of people. He's got to do well at this quiz show. He's devoting his time to learning all this random trivia. Then we have William H. Macy's character, who is like in his 40s, and when he was a kid, he won that quiz show, and is kind of a local celebrity because of that, but at the moment, he's working at this place, and he gets fired unceremoniously, and he's trying to save up money to get braces on his teeth because he's in love with a young bartender, and he believes that if he gets braces on his teeth, this young bartender is going to fall in love with him too, and that's another part of the story. All these stories begin to intertwine. There is also the, an, an old man who's dying. Very, very sick in bed. And uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman plays the nurse who's trying to find his son so he can speak to him before he dies. Then there's Julianne Moore's character who is the very young wife of this very old man and she's going through her own crisis as well. And everything intersects and that is Magnolia. What did you think? That was impressive. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of all, it all feeds into each other. I feel like it's such a well... I don't, I don't think it all feels... Well, if... if parts of it i guess but it's all of it doesn't but it it, it does <laughs> well two sections maybe uh but um y you said that this was like tom cruise's best one of one of his best i think okay i'll just very quickly cut in i can't tell because i don't know the guy but from what i've seen over the years of tom cruise i think he seems like a very nice guy and yeah. usually he plays the 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 hero 
you know, or he plays a comedic part. Here he plays a complete and utter dick, and I think he did such a great job of doing that. Like, I completely bought it. Parts of his performance when he was... Let me finish my sentence. Okay. Parts of his performance when he was playing said dick, Mm -hmm. it looked like he found it amusing that he was playing the part. Okay. There were some times where he said sentences which are revolting, and then he made like a... Like a smile, like, can't believe I'm saying these lines. And then he continues on with the lines. But it's, I understand that it's the character that's making the smile, etc. But also I kind of feel it's Tom Cruise peeking through like, oh, I can't believe I'm saying these things. That kind of face. Okay. So that's what makes it feel real. But at the same time, I can't help but think, this isn't really Tom Cruise. So um, to me, he was, it was a good performance. But I expect it to be like, wow. <laughs> well, it's a but very... it was more like, okay. <laughs> well, it's a very, it's a very different kind of performance. But I mean, you don't really see him in more serious roles. I mean, he has done them from from time to time, and there's been a few I haven't seen. He has serious roles. It's just that they're they they are in action movies or sci fi movies. It could still be serious in those No, movies. I know, I know. but This I, was just a realistic one. As much as I think he's great in all the Mission Impossible movies, I think there's still a limitation there as far as There's loads what of tears in Mission Impossible. There is, but, you know, I just, I don't know. I think that it's one of his best performances, specifically his final moments where the facade breaks down <clears> and he's faced with a very emotional moment. And I read that that scene was... Yeah, that br- scene was good. And that scene was apparently, like, written up to a point and then he just kept going. And they kept that in the movie, so he was like just adding dialogue and and all that kind of stuff. And Philip Seymour Hoffman was reacting off that and kind of so that scene was a little bit more uh, natural and, and kind of flowed further I than you where, meant during the interview. No, in the in the, the the final kind of moments of his character again, we're going to be light on spoilers no, that was to good. begin with. Yeah, 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 it was good. Uh, that it, good emotional stuff. I I like the different stories. A lot of times when these kind of stories go about each other, they're very messy. Uh, the first 10 minutes mm-hmm. that didn't really have anything to do with the main characters, as far as I can remember. Because I remember thinking, is this the way it's going to be throughout the whole movie? Because it was cut, cut, cut. It started out with a, a story about, like, wait, this is the same movie, isn't it? Yeah, it started out about a story about these people back in the day or something. Like, two three people and they were beating a guy or something uh, and that's how the the name of a, of a place came up because they were called name 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 mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah yeah okay good yeah so the beginning there was a lot of oh and then, then this happened and then this happened film... it's like a dialogue over and over and then i was thinking like what am i watching is this gonna make my brain fry but then the story started and she's gonna fall off if she does that and then the story started, and then uh, Tom Cruise was doing his stuff, which piqued my interest because I never heard him say the C word before. So that was interesting. Each individual story was fascinating as well. Even though you don't see the characters for that long, you still feel like you connect with them, which I think is good. Each individual character, when you mentioned all of them, and I remembered all of them because mm-hmm. I've forgotten about the braces guy. Mm-hmm. And I've forgotten about the cop and the girl as well. Yeah. That kind of, when I'm thinking about it now, I remember that I felt something for each each individual character. And sometimes you follow one character throughout a whole movie and you don't really care what happens to them. That's a good point, yeah. So that makes it really good. And on top of that, uh, how, how some of them interact together, I thought was good as well. Yeah, I like it. I liked it when they the the storylines and different characters started converging with each other and crossing paths. You're like, ah, oh, okay, and that that mm. kind of links to that, and that links to that. The uh, the the girl though. Um, the drug addict. Yes. Yeah. Uh, when the dad came into the flat, I thought maybe he was an older boyfriend because mm-hmm. I hadn't seen it before, so I didn't know if. Because there was a picture of him, or there was a very. Not not a picture, but a very short video of him doing stuff with, from behind on a woman. So I didn't know if that was her. Oh, was that? Yeah. 
Was that him? He was famous and stuff like oh, that. Oh yeah, I forgot about so that. So I didn't yeah, know yeah, if yeah, she yeah. was the girlfriend because we never really did see that woman's face as far as I can remember. Oh, I guess that was him cheating on his wife. Yeah, and yeah. so I didn't know if she was the girlfriend and then he said he was her dad so that he could enter the flat. And when she was screaming for him to get out, I was thinking, okay, maybe he is her ex-boyfriend. And then when he was saying, like, that I'm not lying, like, I'm dying of cancer and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, don't get too far into the spoilers. No, but you, you already said cancer. Yeah. Yeah. Then um, I was I was just thinking, no, he just wants her to sympathize. And then... Right, yeah. yeah. There is an element of that, we yeah. think. Yeah. So wh when I realized that she was indeed his daughter, then, of course, things changed. So if I watched it a second time, I would view that scene differently. Yeah, that's true. Because it wasn't... I didn't think that she was... That's true. I guess I knew that going in. Um, the actor is Philip Baker Hall. I just wanted to mention that because I thought he was great in the film. I've seen him in loads of things, but um, his character is, is really dramatically interesting, especially as the film reaches its conclusion. Yeah, so you were saying the film opens with like a montage, basically. <laughs> yeah, these, like, and the stories. montage is mess messy for me. No, I think I think they're brilliantly done. It's um... Because I haven't seen it before. Yeah, but it's th those stories aren't related to what comes later. No, it's but just I didn't a... know that. I thought I had to pay attention. I don't th think you... Well... You do, you do, because, it, I mean, it's just, it's fun mm -hmm. writing, and it's very snappy, kind of, it just, it jumps you right into this world where it's priming you to expect the unexpected, it's telling you these stories that you won't believe how this happened, like the guy who, who jumps out of the, off the top of the building to kill himself, and as he's falling down, he gets shot by his father, who's trying, no, by his mother, who's trying to shoot his father through the window, and she he gets shot. She wasn't trying to shoot, she was just... Threatening. threatening him yeah oh that's right true because he put the bullet in there because he knew they were going to fight and he wanted to end it all yeah uh, and so she ends up kind of getting charged for murder even though he was killing it yeah so if there's kind of a fun uh, well that's not fun <laughs> but the the sequence is they made fun. it they made it seem comedic yeah it, no definitely it's kind of black comedy kind of sequence and then and then <laughs> that that pace of editing continues when we, we meet our main characters and that's when you said is this going to be like this for the rest of the movie yeah point of the Point being, I thought that lasted too long because I started feeling okay. tired with after just 10 minutes of the movie because it was too much of this. Yeah. I felt like I was watching an extended version of the intro of Big Bang Theory. Wasn't that bad? No, I'm not saying it was bad, but it's like if you're trying to like keep up with all the pictures, you're getting a headache. And so I was trying to keep up because I was thinking, okay, this is important information because if I don't read every word of the Star Wars intro every time we watched a movie, you're like, are you going to watch the movie? And I'm like, I've read it before. It's uh, that I kind of thing. The movie started and it's just like, okay, so pay attention. Uh, what was that? What, what, what are these? What? what? Uh, okay, so that's all right. And so are these three people going to be part of the story? No, they're not. And then they go on to the people's. I didn't know when I had to pay attention to the characters because I didn't know whether they're going to be in the movie. I think it's fairly clear because very early on in that montage, you're establishing like at the beginning, it's like old timey footage, so it feels like a flashback or something that's not going to be part of the main story. Then the oh, second they could one. Have been the great grandparents the second one he jumps off the building at the very beginning of that sequence so you know that he's not going to be a character who's going to continue appearing in the it movie it could be a uh, prequel after i suppose anyway so uh leading up to the fact i i love the intro i completely forgot all about it did have i had no memory of it whatsoever so i really enjoyed that because i just didn't remember it even happening and then it leads into the film itself and then the characters get established remember the young the young boy who was doing the rap for john c Riley, and then you know he's like yeah whatever and, yeah. The, and he's like you should listen to that i just told you what you wanted to know yeah we didn't go back and check because apparently what he was rapping no because i was trying to, to pay attention yeah. i didn't understand anyway but the, this film is really dense like i've been looking up on it and it's i love the film but i'm never going to get into it as much as reading into all the details there's, there's a lot of, too many layers there's a lot of not too many just there's too many for me to dive into and want that's to that's what i mean yeah but i don't think that it's bad that it has that many layers i think for people no, who love of course the film, if people want to rewatch a movie again and again and analyze this it's brilliant there's uh, a lot of biblical stuff i think exodus 8 2 something like that and then the the, the numbers 8 and 2 appear throughout the film apparently there's like over 100 or 200 references to that passage like in the film like hidden in little easter eggs and stuff is that where the so, frogs come in yeah i think that's part of it i think that's well, again <laughs> we'll, we'll leave spoilers for just a little bit it's not bit. really a spoiler most it's not... people probably know about that scene and it's on the cover anyway uh is it yeah no no on the back cover okay so where'd you even go with this uh what was your favorite storyline or character that you can remember or the, the one part that you were more engaged with than the rest if you even have one 
Was there any that you felt like when it returned to that character, you're like, oh god, I'm not interested in this part? Um, I'll tell you. Racist mine. guy until he uh, goes back to work to do and, what and, he and it to escalates. Do. Yeah. Um, I like the game show part because the, the kid thing stressed me out. Mm-hmm. Of course, Tom Cruise is always fun to watch, but I didn't like his character, so it wasn't like I was like, oh, let's see what happens with him. So I guess I was more interested in what was happening with Seymour mm-hmm. uh, and the old guy, even well, though I, uh, the, I think there was a part where the old guy was talking where I felt extremely bored. So I didn't like the old guy, but I liked what was happening. Mm, that's fair. Yeah. Like when, when he was talking, I was just like, go back to the others. I guess I was very split feelings because I felt like that with a lot of the things. Some things were great. But the, the game show, that, that was probably the part where I wanted it to continue. Mm-hmm. There's a great shot in the, the game, the quiz show, where I, th- I guess the kid first arrives at the studio and he's walking and the camera's going through Very all the corridors shots. and like going into an elevator, coming back out. So lots of cool stuff like that. Mm. I think it's really crazy that Paul Thomas Anderson was like in his mid-twenties, I think, or late-twenties when he made this film. Um, just considering the scope of it and everything, I think it's such a well-directed film. And the way that it weaves all those different storylines together in a way that, you know, they all link uh, in certain points. And again, as the film reaches its third hour, it all starts to kind of reach a place where you can see where it's going or where it's going to, you know, end up. And then the the big event that kind of joins everyone together kind of at the end happens. The Actually, no, before I get to that, I want to I mention my least favorite part of the film, which was Julianne Moore's character. Uh, she was the wife of the old man who's dying. Uh, the I mean, there's two old men who are dying, really. That's kind of like a thing of the film. It's these two old men who are dying, and they have kind of damaged their family in different ways. And that kind of drives the emotional uh, core of the film, I think. Whereas the other storylines are a bit more... Um, well, I suppose the, the drug addict woman and the cop is quite an emotional story as well, considering you know what she's linked to the father, I guess. It all kind of like links back to each other at certain points. But Julianne well, Moore's sure character... Well, explains why she, the drug addict yeah. is the way she is think, when oh. you realise why. And yeah, you're yeah, just yeah. like, right, well, of course she's the way she is. So, <clears throat> Julianne Moore, hot take, I, I don't really like her as an actress. Um, what? I, I've, I've come to realize this, and I didn't think she gave a good performance in this film. You can now direct all your complaints towards me. I just, I don't buy her. Like, there's a scene when she goes to a, a drugstore, and she's, like, shouting at them and stuff, and it just felt like a performance. It I, felt like, I disagree. It felt like someone acting, and I just didn't connect with her at all in this film. So that was really disappointing, and I'm, wow. now, I'm now beginning to realize, like, even when she won the Oscar for Still Alice, I, I thought she was too much in that film. I was much more impressed with Kristen Stewart in that film than I was her, which is really strange, but I don't know. It's just maybe I haven't seen the right performances from her, but I, I didn't. I thought she was the weak link in this film, and I wasn't really that interested in any of her scenes, unfortunately. I disagree. That's fine. Um, I thought she was great, because in the beginning, I didn't know what her intentions were, but gradually, as I started realizing... I understood why she was reacting the way she did. Yeah, no, it all makes sense. It, it's well written, for sure. Um, and I thought it was well acted on her part. Mm-hmm. Then again, I was watching it for the first time and I was taken in like a thousand and one different acting performances Yeah. from the feels of it. It was like love actually, mm-hmm. in a way, but dark. Um I think everyone acted really well. That's probably yeah. why I enjoyed it. I was just bored by the old man for some reason. The old man dying. Yeah, and I, I Philip Seymour Hoffman is great, and I, yeah, I really he, loved. He really he he was great. Yeah, he, the guy can cry. Yeah, without crying. I, you know even I mean. even like the scene, which is kind of like a tongue in cheek thing, where he's on the phone to the guy and he's like, you know, the scene in the movie where someone really needs something to happen. And someone makes I was it happen. Thinking, this okay, you're gonna look at the camera now. No, yeah, but like, <laughs> you know, it's something you would say in real life. So it kind of, you know, it kind of made sense. But it was kind of a fun little joke, I think. Again, there's so much to talk about. I really like John C. Riley in the film because he's like, I'm not sure really how his career has gone, but all I know him from really is like Step Brothers and like comedic roles for the most part. Who? John C. Riley, the the cop. Oh. 
Didn't you know, know he was in that. Yeah, so, he, so to me, I see him as mainly a comedic actor, whereas this is a completely straight kind of role. And I really I, I thought the, the kind of weird romance with the girl was kind of sweet and, you know, like uncertain when they go on that date. And it's just like, you know, there's a little bit of like awkwardness there. It's and kind she, of high, high schoolish. Yeah. The geek trying to date the... Uh, yeah. The high, the the cheerleader. But like she's with problems. But I like how she's talking about how like you seem so together and like you seem so like you know. Actually, when I'm thinking about it, I didn't like that. No. No. Why would he find that attractive? And why would find the way what she was acting? I felt like her. Uh, maybe he had some kind of like paternal instinct, and he wanted to yeah. take care of her and fix her. I don't know. But there is clearly an attraction there, a sexual yeah. attraction yeah, yeah. for him. The way she was so edgy around him, like nervous, mm-hmm. felt more like she was nervous that he she was going to get caught with the drugs than her being nervous around the guy. Mm. So when he came back to the door and she opened the door right away, I was like, what? Wait, what's going on? And then I, obviously she's on drugs, so she's going to be all edgy, but I mm. felt like it was too much. Yeah. That's my least perf- uh, favorite okay, performance of cool. hers. Yeah, no, I th- I thought she was great. I, I really liked the 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 restaurant scene too. It was it was off. No, I liked it. I liked it because she she laid out the whole like, why don't we just be completely straight with each other? Which is like her way of of saying like, okay, I wanna I wanna be honest with someone. I wanna tell them everything, and you're probably gonna you know get scared off but it is what it is and then it, they kind of get there but then she kind of bottles it and leaves and so because he starts out with a weird thing for him first yeah i guess but i liked how it was it wasn't like it wasn't neat that whole relationship it was very scratchy and kind of natural to me it felt realistic i could understand why he was interested in her i could understand why she was kind of interested in him but couldn't quite fully commit and she's still too wrapped up in her own problems and everything and then uh well we'll talk about the rest when we get to it and then the the main scene i think apart from the ending is the 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 singing the song wise up i believe it's called uh, by amy mann when all the characters are basically sing along singing along to the song now you take a film like this where it's like a really you know serious drama with a little bit of humor here and there and then you take the idea right we're gonna have a song playing in the soundtrack of the movie and all the different characters are going to be singing along to it like a musical. And it sounds like a really bad idea. Yeah, but it, it kind of worked. It worked so well. I, I actually got a little bit moved by it for some reason. Not in any particular... I wasn't really thinking about the characters that much. It was just the overall presentation of it I thought was so well done. It took its time and kind of each character kind of had a verse. And it didn't feel like it was over the top it just kind of seemed to slot in in a way that you would never expect it to for me it was about 70 percent for me yeah some of them didn't pull it off most of them did yeah some of them didn't so there were parts where we were like okay this is good mm-hmm. oh and then he or she ruined it a little bit <laughs> and then it's like okay he or she's good in what, uh, in what then, was it was it purely, i don't remember who no 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 but was it like they sounded off to you or was it no the no no it was the the fact that they were singing okay yeah put me off maybe the old man in the bed as he's dying that that's might kind have of been like, it yeah it's a, the that's the one that stretches singing. they yeah. should have left him out and he should have just been there dead well it's not i don't think it's literally meant to be them singing it's more of a kind of it's like a you know it's like no, a, a movie like, trick it would you be know okay for some of them to be left out Okay, that's fair enough. Because I sing all the time, so that's why I was thinking it's okay <laughs> right. in the okay. beginning. Um, and the whole uh, yeah. the whole movie is filled with songs by Amy Mann, which is interesting. You don't often see that where a director will just take one artist or band and kind of use their music throughout the whole film. But you know, she opens the the film, closes it, and there's kind of songs in between. Did you like those songs and the music? I don't remember them. You don't remember them? Oh, that's a shame. It's like a signature part of the film. A lot of people talk about. I don't um, remember any of the music. I don't especially listen to her music at all, um, or even know that much about her, but I love the songs that are in this film, and they're part of the, the character of it to me when I first watched it. I really I remember listening to that those songs quite a bit. What's a really loud song that the drug addict was playing her song as well? Yep. Oh. Yeah, so that they really kind of <laughs> tied it all in, uh, and I'm sure she probably uh, enjoys some nice residuals from the movie, <laughs> considering a lot of her songs are used in it. So... We'll leave it there before we get to spoilers and uh, get to the the 
the pivotal question, is it a film you should see before you die? Mm, no. <laughs> no, don't get me wrong. It was a good movie, yeah, yeah. but I, I'd be okay without it. And I'm not going to really recommend it to anyone uh, because it's too special. And I don't know anyone that I think would like it except for you. Okay, so you're saying you don't think it's a film you should see before you die, but you also think it's too special. So No, it, weird. Oh. <laughs> Not necessarily good special. I don't... I, and it's too long. Oh. So I honestly don't know anyone that I could recommend this movie to. You meant special because... in the quasi-offensive way. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. You're thinking like that. Okay. Well. It's special in a way where we can... Appreciate it? Appreciate. Yeah. That's the thing. Uh, but... I don't know anyone I can recommend it to. So I can't say it's a movie you must see before you die because I don't know anyone who would want to see it before they die. Hmm. Except for you. Okay. If I, could, if I can recommend a movie to, to people, then yeah, it's definitely something you can see before you die. See, now, now I'm just... But I can't do it. Now I'm just wondering if all the films you've said yes to are also films you would I'm recommend to someone. I'm thinking through that. Yeah. But yeah. Because there, there's so always come to someone... An that, there's always someone that I can think of like, okay, you know that movie that where that and that happens? That's that movie. You should see that one. I can say that about a lot of the movies that I wouldn't necessarily want to see again. Or that not necessarily I know anyone who would want to see, except for because it's a classic and it's got that special thing in it. And that's all. And that's all, okay. If it was two hours, maybe. Hmm. Or an hour and a half, definitely. But it's... No. No, I, I love... And I don't think I want to see it again either. I love that it's three hours because it just, it gives, it gives everything the time to breathe, um... And I, I wouldn't, although I did, I did read that Paul Thomas Anderson said in later years, he thinks it's way too long. So, um, you know, but I, I love it the way it is. It doesn't feel like a three hour movie to me. Uh, well, in a way it does. It feels like a long movie, but it's I not. I remember checking the time when we were about maybe an hour 45 or hour 50 mm -hmm. in. And I was like, it doesn't feel like it's going to end anytime soon. So mm -hmm. someone has kept a secret for me. We should have started watching it earlier. Guilty as charged. Yes. But I, if I told you beforehand, you usually tell me. If I told you beforehand, it was then I would have said that we should have started watching it earlier, so that I would have had a little bit time after. Just like now, this review has already been about half an hour or so, and mm-hmm, yeah, 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 and I would like it to end soon, so I have a little bit of time before I have to okay, go to okay, end. Okay, okay, I think it is a film you should see before you die. I think it's a masterpiece. I love it. Uh, Julianne Moore is the weak link to me. I really loved revisiting it, and yeah, it was just you—you you find the the cop and the the woman the weak part. I didn't say anything about the cop. The cop was fine. Well, well, yeah, well, we disagree on different parts. That's the. That's, I just disagree that's with what, his team up. That's uh, that's movies. We all re review, review, we receive, and can then review them differently. <laughs> so we're now going to get to some brief spoilers. Brief. <laughs> so we can talk about some of the things. And one thing I want to say about Tom Cruise, like I love how like just arrogant and completely misogynistic he is in the film. And then he sits down to be interviewed by this woman. He's not really paying attention to her. She's like, I'm going to button that shirt up. You know, he's just such a sleazeball. And then as she continues to ask him about his family and his past, and he's like, yeah, he's joking it away and, and kind of waving it off. But the further that she goes and the, the deeper that she digs, just the way his expression changes and, and how mad he gets without seeming like he's getting mad, he just gets really quiet. And that's, I think, one of the, the lines of the film people quote a lot. is like, she's like, you know, what are you thinking? He's like, I'm quietly judging you. You know, and you can tell, like, that's such a great performance in that scene. And then, obviously, when he goes and meets his father and breaks down and everything. And I would say when he breaks down, it almost goes a little bit too far with the emotion. But I do think that cutting to Phil Philip Seymour Hoffman's reaction and, and him seeing it and being emotional kind of ties it all together. Um, so I think Tom Cruise is, I just really think he's a, does a great performance in this one. I, I, I agree. I really liked when he was serious and the whole interview thing, even his weird handstand and stuff. It's so cocky. It was yeah, kind of like yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in, um, it's so completely against type for him. And I just thought that was cool. Well, yeah, because he, he can play cocky like he does in, um, 
The pool movie. Oh my god. Oh yeah, of course. How did I? Yeah, the Color of Money. Yeah, he is it's so almost... cocky in yeah, that movie, yeah, 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 yeah. and it's like, oh, what a sleaze ball you are, and he's like, hey, hey, hey. No, but he's just you more. Know? He's just more cocky. Like th- this guy's a proper. Like you know, he's. Yeah, but he's broken. He is. Yeah. 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 So it just shows, like, okay, he had a bad childhood too. Mm-hmm. So he's broken. Uh, I didn't like him in this movie when he was the sleaze ball, which is the correct way for me to react to him. Yeah, he's doing his job. I genuinely disliked... (laughs) Yes. It was... Yeah, it's the way... I generally just properly, really disliked when he was on stage and and doing those things. Mm -hmm. And then I felt myself relax when he was being provoked and he's quiet and everything like that. And I was just like, that's great. Yeah. And what a contrast. He draws you in. Uh, but I thought that I disliked him on the stage because I didn't feel that his acting was good. But maybe that's because he was acting someone who was acting. Yeah. That's that's the way I would And that's it. why it didn't I didn't feel yeah. good about his performance and maybe that's why his like smile every time he said those words. It was because he was angry. The only reason why everything like that happened is because he was angry. And apparently not with his mother, but with his father. Yeah. Uh, and, and lots of those past family details unravel as the film uh, reaches its third act. And uh, it's, just a, it's, a, it's kind of a great but awful introduction when uh, Tom Cruise is on the stage and the light comes down. And it's like the 2001 A Space Odyssey theme. Well, it's not really a theme, but it's a classical piece of music we all associate with 2001 A Space Odyssey. And his first line of dialogue is, respect the cock. And like, I can just only imagine what people, including you, seeing that for the first time are like, what the hell? Where is this going? Uh, so that that's a memorable memorable part of the film for me is Tom Cruise's um, part in it. The William H. Macy stuff with the braces... Uh, it's kind of in- enjoyable, you know, uh, interesting and kind of sad the way that he feels like he can just cosmetically change himself and that'll make someone fall in love with him. So it's kind of sad. Which is what every woman thinks. I every s- woman thinks I should do something about my face or my body and people will like me more. No, but this this is copying something from the person that you're in love with, like to the... Yes. Well, how does well, a woman no, do that? Not, not necessarily. But it's it's but it also, medical surgery in order to do something well, about your looks. It doesn't suppose, necessarily mean that you have to make yourself look better. But this would catch his attention because they would have something in common. Yeah, but yeah, so it's so he po- can't grow boobs. Yeah, but it's, yeah, but it's it, it's so pointless, and it's something like you're messing with something that you don't need to mess with. I guess maybe you view that it's with exactly the way the you same think thing. it is. I don't know because yes, I, mean, I do. A woman gets a haircut; it's a little bit different. No, it's like I'm talking fixing your nose. Oh, you mean plastic yeah, surgery? Yes. Okay. Well, I... That's what we do. And now men do the same thing. Well, it's my opinion that people who do that are, are kind of complete... sad and pathetic. Well, it's exactly what so many people I do. I mean, do what you want to do, but I think that, you know, when you start... I would if I had the money too. I would change myself too, yeah, but I, I don't. I wouldn't agree with that because you're, you're, you know, you're perfect you the way would, you are. But it wouldn't be for you. It would be for me. That's different. That's different. No, because it's still about how the world sees me. You know. I know I look at myself in the mirror, but you yeah, know, yeah. age right. and everything. But for him, he, he's not doing the braces to make himself feel better about himself or for anyone else in the world to look at him differently. He's he just doing it for that one person. He would feel better about himself if that one person liked him. Yeah, and, and it's this unrealistic, it's this younger guy, you know, I just... It's I not unrealistic. Well, if the guy was gay, he only got jealous when that guy talked to another man. He didn't get jealous when he was talking to the woman. I suppose. Anyway, but I, 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 I don't know. No I just, proof that he's gay. At I, I just find that the, the the whole storyline kind of you know. But the guy sad. by the bar definitely know. was. Yeah. The older guy. But when it starts picking up and he's decided to to rob his you know and then the key gets snapped in the thing and then he <laughs> climbs up the building and falls. That off was the, funny. That you know, was interesting. You know. um, so and how he <laughs> changed his mind. Oh yeah, sure. Now one one last Smashed thing before we get face, before we get to the frogs. Enough. Yeah, that, I mean, that was kind of the cruel irony of it. Mm. And he probably would need braces after that. So mm. the Philip Baker Hall character, the old the, the quiz show host, you know, he kind of collapses during the, the show and stuff. And he's, a lot of stuff is going on. And the final scene with his wife, that is the image to me that was burned into my memory from when I first saw the film when I was a teenager. It's just that the weird way he's kind of like sloped on the sofa, like almost unmoving. Like he's kind of like leaning back like that, looking at his wife and telling her that I've cheated on you and all of this and 
she, I mean, I don't know who the actress was, but I thought she did a great job. I mean, she doesn't do much in the film overall, but in that final scene, the way she reacts to this and, you know, she kind of takes a drink and she's just like, you can tell she probably knew this. And then she asks him, did you touch our daughter? And that's when it's like, oh shit. Not even the fact that this, this would be revealed, but the fact that she probably knew it deep down. And, and why would she stay with him? That's the complexity of, 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 of humans, I guess. But that, that realization that she has a sneaking suspicion, or perhaps that her daughter has said something to her, I don't know. She, she refused to believe it. And now that he's at this moment where he's saying, I've cheated on you, I want to, you know, apologize for everything. And when she asks him, did you touch our daughter? Just the, I don't know. I don't know. You would know. That's, but, but, but there's, I know there's... He that didn't want to say it. But he knew. There's that element of doubt because he's he's you know he's he's got cancer. I don't know if it's his brain or whatever. But the way he plays it, he he seems so confused. I, I think deep down he did he does know. But I I like I like how it isn't clear. I like how it's just so heartbreakingly like. There, there's no um what's the term? There's no uh, release for either of them because he can't admit it. Whether he doesn't remember it or whether he doesn't want to remember it, he might be repressing it completely. Or, you know, the fact that she can't get that release of him admitting it. So it's such a heartbreaking situation. And then a frog falls through the skylight and smashes down. And I think he, he oh, he was going to kill himself, wasn't he? Mm. He had the gun to his... I don't know if he actually shoots himself. Uh, he does, his blood. ear is bleeding. His ear is bleeding, so he might have not, you know, but that's no, when No, he all... wasn't going to get that relief. <laughs> right, yeah, that's a good point. Then the frog scene happens. <laughs> It's literally raining frogs, which probably ties into the, the biblical thing. And I guess it's about all these things converging, like the stories and the characters and the emotions, and then poof. And I was telling you that this has actually happened in the past, and you were like, bullshit. Yeah, and so, I had to Google it. Right, yeah. And I, I was the same when I first heard about this. I thought, no. Actually, what I Googled, you're waiting for me to explain this now, because I couldn't believe that frogs could rain down from the sky. But apparently, if there's such a thing as a... Um, a tornado, cyclone. A, a, a water spout. A oh, water spout, right. Uh, that can pick up fish yeah. and frogs. Yeah. That's mainly what gets picked up because they're so light. It can actually get picked up so high. And then because the winds are higher up there as well, they can, can travel for miles before they finally drop down. And sometimes it can just be like a couple of dozens. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be hundreds. But there has been reportings of thousands so of fish and frogs falling from the sky. Most of the time they die up there because they freeze to death. But, yeah. It's a hell of a way to go, isn't it? <laughs> well, there are worse ways. <laughs> there are worse ways of going. <laughs> at, least, um... <laughs> at least they get to fly. But, um, yeah, so unbelievable until... It's still an unbelievable until I see it, but which I hope I don't. <laughs> but yeah, so nothing biblical about it, just science. Yeah, uh, which is another interesting. Like when I first saw the film, I didn't like it. That was the only thing I didn't like about the film. I thought it was too over the top and too ridiculous for a film that was a straight drama. Then it isn't. Then it isn't. So that's kind of interesting. Well, maybe they it was a bit over the top. I don't know. Oh yeah, they definitely over such a wide area. Yeah, you know? I mean that's kind of the exaggeration, I think, yeah. and it kind of. Again, cast that element of doubt. Anyway, so overall, I love the film, and the final scene is great. But uh, like, I was, I was like really into it. Where um, the cop comes in, girl sitting there distraught, and he, he kind of is talking to her, and he's basically giving her like the end of the movie speech to kind of convince her that you know this is going to work, but we should try and make this thing work. And he sits down next to her. But as he's given this speech, there's music playing over it, so you can only just hear the dialogue. That's why I don't remember the speech. Right. So I'm. I'm thinking like, what? So I'm really into it, and then as the credits end, I'm like, oh god, that was so great. And then you're just like, yeah, if there were subtitles there, I wouldn't have heard any of that. <laughs> and you kind of like completely cut through the kind of. I was like, oh. Yeah, because it distracted me. But I like that it's kind of if, half hidden. I like that it's kind no, of almost... It, I wouldn't be able to catch any of what he said, maybe a word here or there, yeah. if there were no subtitles. If this was in the cinema, I'd be like, what the hell is going on? you got to really listen, then you can catch it, I think. I was and, really trying to listen, and you but don't... then I just gave up and looked at the subtitles, which took away from it. And you don't see his face, it's just purely the camera's moving in on her face, and then she looks at the camera and smiles, and that's the end. I, I don't think remember it's... what he said. 
I don't remember um, the specifics oh. either, but it's 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 pretty much saying like, look, you're trying to run away from this. I I think that we something can can work here. Basically, I don't remember the lines exactly. Which it is probably really... why I don't remember it either, because I didn't believe in the relationship at all. That's true. Yeah. From the very get go. Yeah, if you weren't to into me, it, then it, it was have... nothing but her trying to hide the drugs, and then they went to dinner, and it got confusing. Because I didn't think that there was any kind of spark between them whatsoever. He was just awkward because she's a pretty blonde girl. And then she was just completely stressed out because what if he finds her drugs? And that was what I was feeling when he was in the house. It's like, okay, you're going to get the coffee and then you're going to go, right? Where Where's her drugs? And then when he came back, so like, oh, shit, it's going to go back in again. That was what I was feeling. I didn't feel any of that. Well, I feel if she just wanted to get rid of him, then she would say, no, I don't want to go to dinner with you. And that would be the end of it. It's a very, this is a very easy thing to do. No, to me, that would have been, if I go to dinner with him, then maybe he won't try and look through my apartment again or something. Mm, no, I don't think so. Because who, what criminal would go to dinner with a cop? Uh, I guess that's a stretch. I, I, I think there is an interest from her. And I mean, we already saw that she was sleeping with someone who wasn't very, you know a good person or you know is enabling her with the drugs and everything at least and so she's being caught in that cycle i think yeah of course when you view it like that from the beginning and of course from the second time around and you're thinking like that that's fine yeah but my thinking was in the complete opposite direction so i didn't think that there was anything coming from her towards him okay. which made that whole thing unbelievable for me okay and I think we'll end it there. So, <laughs> Magnolia. Um, I don't remember what he said. <laughs> I don't remember specifics either, but it, it, the, I don't know. It, it, I like how the dialogue is half buried in the, the, the sound mix and the music. And I don't know, I just love the, the way that last scene unfolds. The camera slowly pushing in. We just see his back and he sits down and it's focused on her reacting. She doesn't say anything in the scene. We're just seeing someone's reaction. Usually in a scene like that, we'll see the person as they're given this monologue. It's the complete opposite. And it's more focused on her receiving that. Um, speech. She might not have heard it because she listened to really loud music. <laughs> She's got tinnitus. It's just like just and the ears whole ringing. time she was thinking, well, at least it wasn't raining cats and dogs. He's overdoing his reaction. He, he's a little bit amused by it. No, yes, it was, a it tiny, was, tiny bit. That was brutal. That was no, it wasn't. Oof. That should have been a joke. He should have gone in and he should have said, Hoo -hoo. did you see that? Well, at least it wasn't raining cats and dogs. I think the reference to raining cats and dogs is made at some point in the film, whether it's before or during or after. I'm, I'm pretty sure Maybe. there's like a, a reference to that. Um, anyway, Magnolia. I think it is a great film. I think everyone should see it. So we disagree on this one, but um, at least you enjoyed it. And That's at least we thing. know that if any dog gets close to Tom Cruise, he will drop kick it. <laughs> oh, God, <laughs> That's what he said, right? Yeah, he just, said drop kick just to twice. keep that dog away from like this. He's such a dick. <laughs> yeah, and I'm just like, I'll drop kick you in a minute. Oh, yeah. Um, anyway, so mm. that was it. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next. Do you think it's a movie you should be seeing before you die? You didn't say that, did you? Yes. Did you? Oh. Well, multiple times. Oh. Hello, McFly. <laughs> I mean, it's been an hour, so... It hasn't been an hour. It's been four... That's a very long video. So we'll see you in the next one. Thank you. <laughs> you didn't even want to finish the four. <laughs> 46 minutes of recording mm -hmm. of the camera. It might have been a little bit less than that in the final 14 video. 14 minutes away from an hour. Mm. So thank you for watching. We'll see you in the next... Definitely shorter. much shorter video. Video, yeah. Goodbye. Bye.